Якби мене хтось запитав чи сказав мені, що скажімо, рік тому назад ще тут буду стояти і говорити на такій імпрезі, я би ніколи не повірив би то. Я, я не є, я в таких стосунках, звичайно, не, не, не входжу. А те, що сталося минулого квітня, а, я не знаю, чи хтось міг би таке ігнорувати. Я, я тут ходив до, до, до церкви, тут був хрещений, то я можу сказати, що 50 років ходжу до цієї а, церкви. І а, я просто я не заходжу такі речі, аж поки воно вже майже мене туди пхає. Я так скажу, я, я вважаю, що я kind of forced to, uh, to, to, to get into this. Ніякого іншого, щоб тільки ігнорувати, казати, що я не буду на це дивитися, я не зміг то робити. То, uh, те, що я сьогодні буду казати, я прочитаю uh, більшість цього по-англійському, бо я uh, сказав, що я хотів поговорити трошки про легальну uh, сторону і підхід, як ми можемо вийти з цієї ситуації. So, good morning. I would like to begin today's talk by first thanking Metropolitan Yuri for his letter dated April 19th, 2012. The letter was so offensive and struck a nerve so strongly that it became the catalyst which galvanized and woke up Ukrainian Orthodox Christians in Canada as well as worldwide. The letter clearly exposed the direction in which our Metropolitan has been trying to lead the UOCC, which I am certain is a destructive one to Ukrainian Orthodox people in Canada as well as abroad. The main idea I will convey today is that the points of agreement signed between the EP and UOCC in 1990 was done illegally because it went against our charter and bylaws and that we need to get the agreement declared illegal by a Canadian court of law. We live in Canada, have religious freedom and no agreement made deceitfully with a foreign entity can prevent us from associating with another religious group, let alone a group which is closest to us historically as a Ukrainian people. It is both shameful and unconscionable that anyone would even think of attempting this, let alone the people in whom we have put our trust into. Mr. Oris Sametz, who held a degree in law, wrote a paper in 1998 titled A Legal Analysis of the Points of Agreement between the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada and the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople. I will read parts and summarize parts of his paper right now. First, there are 12 points in the agreement. So this is Mr. Samets' uh, analysis now. On May 24, 1998, Metropolitan Vasily and the very Reverend Dr. Kravchenko, Chairman of the Presidium of the Consistory, were in Ottawa for the arrival of the Patriarch of Constantinople for his Canadian visitation. They took advantage of this to have an information meeting with the parish members of the Ottawa Church. Among other matters, the points of agreement between the UOCC and the Ecumenical Patriarchate was discussed. When asked about the present status of the Standing Conference of Canonical Orthodox Bishops of America, SCOBA, the reply was that SCOBA was no longer in existence. When further asked about the present status of point nine of the agreement, which grants the UOCC membership in SCOBA, Metropolitan Vasily replied that point nine of the agreement is as of now inoperative. Point four, point six, and point six refer to his eminence, the Archbishop of the Americas, as the Exarch of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. 
Since this position no longer exists, these points of agreement must also be non-operative. In addition, point 10 is partly inoperative in its reference to His Eminence, the Exarch of the Americas. Of the 11 substantive points of agreement, three are inoperative and the fourth is partly inoperative. However, despite the fact that over 25% of the points of agreement are inoperative, the real problem with the points of agreement between the UOCC and the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople is that the substantive points violate the charter and bylaws of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada at the time they were signed. In the preamble to the bylaws, it is stated the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada is the sole self-governing ecclesiastical organization of Ukrainian Orthodox Christians on the territory of Canada and is governed in all temporal, uh, meaning relating to the material uh, world, and spiritual matters, so temporal and spiritual matters, by its charter being the status of Canada, 1929, chapter 98, and so on, its constitution passed in accordance, in pursuance with said charter and bylaws, as here and after stated. So it's, it's quite clear, there was, there was a charter that, was, that, was, uh, that we have to follow, and um, if we deviate from it, do we have to legally take a look and see if, if what we've done is allowable in, in, uh, uh, by, by, the, by the law. Bylaw 2 reads, the church preserves dogmatic unity with all orthodox autocephalous churches. It is equal in rights with them and independent in its polity and administration. To underline the autocephalous position of the church, the extraordinary Sobor of August 8th and 9th, 1951, passed a resolution adopting the bylaws in their present form, along with two resolutions that form part of the statutes and the bylaws of the UOCC. Uh, by the way, this, because I'm, I'm learning a lot of these things as I go uh, along, uh, this the statutes and bylaws was reprinted in 2008 by the by the Bratstva here at the church. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's both in Ukrainian and in English. Um, it's the original form. It has not been altered. Uh, what it appears that's been happening over the years is that parts simply disappear of the original, and people have nothing to compare it to. So this is what um, our leaders right now, they wish us to simply forget what was in here before, and but, but it's not gonna happen, because this has been reprinted, it's, it's, it's new, and now we have something to compare it uh, against. Point five, so again, this is point five of the uh, agreement, is redundant in that the statute and bylaws of the UOCC cover this point, except for the primate commemorating the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. However, we see that the patri what the patriarch has done with this point with the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in the USA. Point five is virtually the same as point five in the USA agreement. So there's been a lot of parallels of what's happened in the States and here except the bishops are named Constantine Metropolitan in the USA, and Archbishop of Chicago, Archbishop Anthony of New York, and Washington, D.C., etc. However, the patriarch saw fit to designate Metropolitan Constantine of Ironopolis, and Archbishop Anthony of Ieropolis, and so on. On his visit to South Boundbrook, the Patriarch did not refer to the American bishops by their USA jurisdictions, but by archbishops of Aaronopolis, etc. I personally would be offended if that were to happen, but uh, evidently, I guess if you have to answer to somebody, uh, uh, you, have, you have to be careful of what you say. Point six of the agreement requires the primate to first consult with the Exarch of the Americas and then submit a slate of candidates 
for the office of the Met Metropolitan and Bishops to a subord for approval in the first instance. The names of candidates so approved shall then be submitted to the Holy Sacred Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarch for approval for consecration. This subverts the subordinate problem of principles of our church and is a subtle way of transforming our church into <coughs> synodal form with the synod of the patriarch making the final decision. This clearly contravenes bylaw 3G and bylaw 16 of our church. Bylaw 3G reads, the supreme legislative body of the church in all its temporal and spiritual matters is its subor. Without limiting its competence, the said subor considers and makes its decisions in the following matters. Appointment and retirement of bishops, and admission of candidates to the Episcopacy. Bylaw 16 reads, the Sobor shall elect bishops or candidates to the Episcopacy of the Church and shall determine the respective titles and shall also designate their appropriate duties in their service to the Church. Under point seven, the Holy Myrrh and the Holy Antimons will be given by the Patriarch to the Metropolitan for distribution. Bylaw 17b reads, the primate of the church is the first and highest ranking archbishop. As archbishop, in addition to his usual religious responsibilities, he fulfills all duties which pertain only to the office of, of primate, including blessing of antimons, preparation of holy myrrh. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada is a corporation, as Panchachuk mentioned earlier, by a special act of the Parliament of Canada. Its powers to enter into agreements are limited by that special act and the bylaws it passes. Any agreement going beyond those powers is void as being ultra-virus, <clears throat> i.e. beyond its powers. With this analysis, it becomes abundantly clear that under Canadian law, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada, a Canadian corporation, did not have the powers to be a party to consummate the agreement headed points of agreement between the Ukrainian Greek Orthodox Church of Canada and the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople. Accordingly, the UOCC should also advise the Patriarchate. Mr. Samets further stated, Metropolitan Vasily and Father Yarmus chairman of the External Relations Commission, and also chairman of the Presidium, met with the Patriarchal Synodal Committee, Committee of the Inter-Orthodox Issues in Istanbul, Turkey, on March 18, 1989. The purpose of the meeting was to discuss the draft points of agreement. The Patriarchal Committee consisted of six Metropolitans, one professor, and an Archimandrite who was the secretary of the committee. Metropolitan Christomos was present, president of the Synodal Committee. In an informational memorandum prepared by Father Yagmus, Metropolitan Christomos is quoted as saying that we commence by asserting that your church and your clergy are canonical and this question is beyond discussion. So, this is my comment, so before any argument, before any agreement was made, we were told we were canonical. The points of agreement did not make us canonical. Uh, yet I've heard the term and, and, and so forth. I hear a lot of um, bouncing around, so to speak. It's, it's, like, it's like, you know, you're, you're, you, you say one thing, they say something else, you say another thing, and it just keeps going back and forth. And it's hard to nail down why exactly did we enter this agreement. I, I personally am not really sure. Uh, I don't see any any valid uh, um, valid any good reasons that would, that would outweigh us. Uh, like the, the the benefits, I don't see outweighing uh, the negatives. That's, 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 that would be an understatement. So, if canonical recognition was what our church wanted, we had it without entering into the agreement with the patriarch that was ultra virus. It is unthinkable that our hierarchy, our consistory board and the External Relations Commission, headed by Father Yagmus, who was also chairman of the Presidium, were not aware 
that the powers of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada were limited by its act of incorporation and its bylaws. In a letter dated on September 15, 1989, to Arch Archimandrite Melitan Karas, Chief Secretary of the Holy and Sacred Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, forwarding a revised copy of the points of agreement, Father Yavus states, and he was one of the ones that was uh, instrumental in, in, in the signing, we must be mindful of both our Orthodox Ukrainian Canadian tradition of over 70 years and the laws of the land. In other words, we cannot act contrary to our charter passed by Parliament of Canada in 1929, which states the name of this entity as the Ukrainian Greek Orthodox Church of Canada, nor to our bylaws passed by the Special General Council Sobor in 1951 and revised by the General Council in 1955, which speak of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada as a metropolia composed of three eparchias, dioceses, i.e. as a distinct entity with its appropriate internal structure and organization. However, for reasons unknown, they acted contrary to the Charter and the bylaws. The approval of the points of agreement at the 1990 Sobor does not in any way legalize the agreement. So, you know, you can, you can, you can agree and pass stuff, but if it's not legal, it's, it's not legal. Although the Sobor in the supreme legislative body of the church in all of its temporal and spiritual matters, it cannot assume powers not given to it by its charter and bylaws. There is little likelihood that the Sobor would have approved the points of agreement had it been advised that such action was ultra virus. There was a responsibility on the part of the hierarchy and the consistory board to advise the 1990 Sobor. Whether this was done willfully or through ignorance, I'm not in a position to determine. During the, the meeting with the Metropolitan and the Chairman of the Presidium and the Ottawa Parish on May 24, 1998, Father Kravchenko became visibly irritated and abusive when questions were posed concerning the points of agreement. Father Kravchenko asked the question, are you trying to teach me about the agreement? Implying that he was fully knowledgeable about the agreement and we were not. There are no advantages in the UOCC coming under the Omoforan of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Patriarch Bartholomew claims only three and a half million Orthodox faithful, that's quoted in Newsweek November 97. The Orthodox Church in Greece has been autocephalous for nearly 150 years and does not come, come under his Omoforan. His influence is confined to Greeks living in areas of Asia Minor, the islands in the Aegean Sea, Greeks in the Diaspora, and now Ukrainians in the Diaspora. The mother church concept is a myth propagated to restore prestige to a once proud patriarchate that has been in a decline for many centuries. How can a Canadian Ukrainian Orthodox Church refer to the patriarchate of Constantinople as the mother church when over three centuries ago it sold our real mother church in Ukraine to the Moscow Patriarchate. In 1993, worldwide news media reported that Patriarch Bartholomew publicly condemned the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the USA as, quote, the Church of the Devil. However, in 1995, he was in Eucharistic Union with this Church of the Devil. In, in April 1994, in a major press interview, Patriarch Bartholomew publicly stated that he categorically, categorically rejects the independent Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Ukraine and that Moscow's control over the churches in Ukraine is to remain inviolate. In July 95, in his Protocol 937 to Patriarch Alexei of Moscow and all Russia, Patriarch Bartholomew gave assurances that he quote, has taken proper care in the settlement of the Ukrainian question in the diaspora, so as to allow Moscow a free hand in Ukraine. Patriarch Bartholomew further wrote, 
In this regard, we would like to assure you that the induction of the Ukrainian communities into the canonical order of the Orthodox Church by receiving them under the own foron of the ecumenical patriarch will, we believe, finally prove to be beneficial for the relationship between the Most Holy Church of Russia and the faithful in Ukraine. This is so because on the one hand, those received were obliged to declare that they would not seek autocephaly of the Ukrainian church, or even part of it, through known methods employed by the autocephalists who operate in every possible way. On the other hand, it is no longer possible for them to cooperate, that's us, or commune with schismatic Ukrainian groups which are out of communion with the Orthodox Church without bearing harm to themselves. So my question is, who was this agreement beneficial for? Another example of Patriarch Bartholomew's machinations was his visit to Odessa to meet with Moscow's Patriarch Alexei and Metropolitan Volodymyr of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate in September 1997. Patriarch Bartholomew refused to meet with the representatives of the other two independent Ukrainian Orthodox churches who had sought an, an audience with him in Odessa. The visit was reported on by numerous news services, including Associated Press, Reuters, the State Information Agency of Ukraine, Patriarch Bartholomew's office of Ist in Istanbul, as well as the Greek Archdiocese of, in the United States. Patriarch Bartholomew is quoted as saying, among other things, that he recognizes only the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under the jurisdiction of the Moscow Patriarchate. The problem of Ukrainian Orthodoxy is to be resolved by Moscow's Patriarch Alexei, and that this is within his control and capacity to do. When specifically asked about the Odessa meeting, Bishop Yuri and Father Boyko asserted to our parish on May 13, 1998, that the news reports of the meeting were sourced in Moscow and not trustworthy. So I guess you can't trust Reuters and all those other uh, agencies that were present. They also stressed that Patriarch Bartholomew's visit to Odessa was an environmental mission and not an ecumenical one. Despite the fact that it was the Ecumenical Patriarch's own press service that reported so extensively on Odessa. I have had the opportunity to research the agreement with the Ecumenical Patriarchate with many of my legal colleagues before I prepared and wrote this analysis. Your brother in Christ, Boris R. Samet. So, what has happened since the legal analysis in 1998? There were amendments made to the UOCC Charter in 1990. The bylaws in English were amended in 2010. I was told that in order to be in, a, to be in effect, the new bylaws are not fully legal until accepted in both languages by a sobor. And this, again, I believe that the, that the Ukrainian part of it, so we know that parts have been taken out, the Ukrainian part, however, I guess because there's much, much more, it's harder to fool people in Ukrainian, especially those that are concerned about this, we have this here. And they, they need to change that into uh, the Ukrainian part. It has to be accepted. And it has not yet. So I think we have to be very vigilant and make sure that it doesn't get accepted unless it's in its original form. Um, and so I say this is good because we can prevent the Ukrainian version of the bylaws from being passed and therefore making the new bylaws, which are harmful to us, not in effect. In conclusion, our hierarchy is responsible, is responsible for a very bad deal with the EP. The negatives of the deal far outweigh any benefits it has brought the UOCC. I stand before you here today in my Ukrainian shirt. I put this on for a reason today because my Ukrainian heritage and my Ukrainian Orthodox faith are equally important to me. Look at our churches. They have halls built for Ukrainian cultural events. 
Ukrainian culture and religion go hand in hand. UOCC parishioners will simply not allow the two to be separated. I've heard about pan-Orthodoxy, didn't know what that was either. Read about it? Pan-Orthodoxy, in my belief, is a failed idea for a multicultural country like Canada. So to our priests who are helping support this failed idea, the ones that are, I ask you to reconsider your position because you will get little support from UOCC members, I believe. And by the way, when you, when you uh, use the internet and you Google um, uh, for, for presidents, for example, of local area pan-Orthodoxy, You'll be, you may be surprised to find who, who's, who's, uh, who's there. I certainly was. To Metropolitan Yuri, you perceive that the EP is your boss. I remember him saying this uh, uh, at the end of uh, when he was here. Uh, to this belief of yours, I emphatically state he is not. It is time you take the responsibility that was entrusted to you by the people. You are the only boss that the UOCC has. Our charter and parishioners demand it. If our polite requests fall on deaf ears, which it seems that this has been the case so far, then we will have no choice but to use more forceful measures. Metropolitan Yuri, for example, just personally, has not answered even one of my emails that I sent to him since April. We've, we've, we've it was discussed today that there seems to be a lack of willingness of, of communication on, on the part of our uh, hierarchy. I think, I believe that there was a statement made that there was going to be an attempt to educate us because we parishioners don't really know much about the goings on, um, I guess, from the consistory's point of view. Uh, I've learned a lot in the last uh, eight months and I would like to be educated, certainly, by the Metropolitan, but I think we have to have a, a line of communication open between us. If there's no communication, uh, I can't see how that's going to happen. Perhaps legal language will be the language we should try speaking next with our hierarchy. And I fully believe that this is the only way that something's going to happen. We've seen case upon case, example upon example, of things that don't appear right, we write letters, we ask. I understand, maybe myself as, a, as an individual, I write a letter, I think I, sh I, I, I would be, I should have an answer or someone reply to me, but certainly a parish, parish upon parish after parish is writing, asking for questions and no answers are provided. What is going on? I would call upon all church parish councils in the UOCC, I mean all of them, and this is what I think the Brotherhood is trying to do now. We are trying to educate people. I certainly didn't know there was any kind of issue. The only issue that, the reason I noticed this was with, with Patriarch Philadette's visit. It shone a very bright light on, it shed light on a bigger problem. So I believe that this should be done through the parish councils. We can we can have we can meet here. We can meet. Uh, you can you can let more people know about it across Canada. Make people aware of what's happening, and that's good. But ultimately, it has to be the parish councils who are empowered to act, uh, to retain a lawyer, to make the de demands, have an, uh, a more current analysis of of the, the legal uh, implications of, of all this. You know, the, the consistory, it seems that when, they're, when they have meetings, or when there's some kind of meeting, uh, when Metropolitan Yuri was here at the end of April, there's a lawyer there. We don't seem to have a lawyer that, that's, that's, that's up to speed with all this that can counter what they're saying. They, they'll say something, it's kind of hard to answer if you don't know all the legal uh, implications. So. I believe that if, we, if, if the ch uh, church parish councils in the US, UOCC meet together in the near future and in a united front launch a legal challenge to
to have the agreement with the EP declared illegal. That's, that's, that's the only way. Now, we don't have to do this in an antagonistic way. We, we simply say, we believe that this, we've had several legal analysis over the years. Uh, let's, let's have a look at it. And if there is a problem, if there's, if there's something that's not right, let's uh, get a ruling on it. Because after all, we are supposed to be uh, following the charter and, and the bylaws. So thank you. Sorry, and one more thing. Uh, I, I want to thank Panyuta Doc and, and others that, because it, it seems like there's a bit of a void here. Like so much, when you look at the history, this is this has gone on for at least since 1990. So that's 22 years. Um, if there's a lot of stuff that's been changed. So Panyuta Doc, when I asked her for like the, the charter, which I'd never looked at before. And, and various papers, she has all that. So we need to work together. Younger people, actually I'm not that young, but uh, <laughs> we, need, we, we need various, the whole spectrum. The people that have most experience to the people that have uh, no. sort of medium experience and then bring in people that need to, to learn. Because I'm sure if people really find out what's, what's going on, they're gonna say, are you kidding me? Is that, are you, are, are, is that really what's happening? We have to keep, you know, having these seminars, educate people, and we need to work together so the people that have all the experience and knowledge can can pass that on to uh, to, to the other the others. Thank you, Bruce.